John chapter 17, um, the final movement in this upper room discourse takes place right here in the most holy place as Jesus Christ, the great intercessor, prays a prayer to his Father. The uh, prayer breaks down into three uh, parts here in that in verses 1 through 5, he prays for himself. And uh, verse 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples that are with him at that time. And then in verses 20 through 26, he prays for the church that will come in the future. And uh, it's a beautiful prayer. We, let's just read through those first five verses again, even though we covered them last week, and then we'll, we'll move into uh, verses 6 uh, and onward as he starts praying for his disciples. Uh, 17, uh, John 17, verse 1, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Again, the prayer, initially he prays for himself. He is going to go to the cross in the next 24 hours. And he's praying the number one concern of his heart, which is, Father, the hour has come that thy Son may glorify thee. I mean, he lived for the very purpose to glorify his Father. And again, we talked about that last week, how important it is for us to live with that purpose in mind, that we're to glorify God. And secondarily is that he would give the gospel and eternal life to people in verse 2. Uh, secondarily, our work is service to the Lord, but primarily it's to glorify God. So it's a precious prayer, and he uh, talks about eternal life is to know the only true God in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a package deal. You don't know the true God without knowing Jesus Christ. Now he's going to change. I mean, he's been stealing, stealing up his will and his heart in preparation for the cross, and he's thinking, I came for this hour to glorify you, Father. So he's, he's strengthening himself in prayer. We need to do that too. When we pray, we need to strengthen ourselves through communion with God. And the communion is such that we're asking to be drawn closer to God that we may glorify God. And as long as we ask that of the Father, the Father will answer that prayer because that prayer is according to his will. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. But now he, he moves in verse 6 into a prayer for the disciples that are in the upper room with him. And he's going to, to shift from himself to his brethren, if you will. And of course, when you and I pray, the Lord would like us to know that we just don't pray for ourselves, we pray for the brethren. And that's very important. The brethren that we know. He's praying for the brethren right there in the upper room with him. And we need to pray one for another and so fulfill the law of Christ, bear one another's, bearing one another's burdens. That's what we ought to be doing. And so we see the movement of the prayer here. Now, in this particular part, Jesus Christ is going to uh, begin the work of the high priest ministry as an intercessor. Jesus Christ had three offices to fulfill. All the three offices that were spelled out for him in the Old Testament. The Old Testament offices were prophet, priest, and king. His ministry, he served as a prophet. That's why he says in his prayer, uh, verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. As a prophet, I have spoken the words to them. Verse 8, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. His prophetic office is, is at the end now. He's coming to the end of the prophetic office. He's, he's on the very last day of the prophetic office. He's now transitioning into the office as the intercessor of high priest. Let me give you an example. Go back to Exodus chapter 28. Exodus 28. We'll be looking at these things in our Exodus study when we come here, but uh, the scriptures do fit together so well. They dovetail together so well. The Holy Ghost like a dove, and uh, it puts these things together beautifully. In Exodus chapter 28, 
We are seeing uh, uh, the Lord is uh, teaching uh, Moses in verse 1 what Aaron is to do. And he says, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So in the book of Exodus, you will see that Moses fulfills the office of prophet and Aaron fulfills the office of priest. There's a division there. Moses is the prophet. He will get the words. Aaron will do the work of the priest like it says right here in the first verse. And then it tells a number of things that uh, Aaron will be doing as the priest. And he says in uh, verse 28, uh, as there's certain articles that they're to put together, and they shall bind the breastplate. This is something that Aaron would wear on the front. By the rings thereof, unto the rings of the ephod. This was something he wore on the shoulders with a lace of blue. That it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod. And the breastplate shall not be loosed from the ephod. So what he's got is he's got these two articles that he's wearing. One on his heart, the breastplate. One on his shoulders. Shoulders where you do lifting with. One on your heart where your emotions are. And where your heart is. Verse 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth unto the holy place for memorial before the Lord continually. Aaron the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy place. Okay, this John chapter 17, we're in the most holy place. Jesus is speaking to his father. He's in the throne room right there speaking to his father spiritually. And, and he's doing the work of Aaron the high priest and he's got on his heart, on the breastplate, the names of all the children of Israel as he's bringing them before the Lord. And so Jesus is beginning to fulfill right here the office of high priest. That's what we're going to be seeing in the 17th chapter as he begins praying for the disciples. Uh, for example, turn to Isaiah chapter 8. He's going to bring the names of those before the Father. This verse here is going to be um, taken by the Holy Spirit and reiterated in Hebrews chapter 2, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ as the high priest in his prayer life. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me. I and the children whom the Lord hath given me. Now, this is a messianic verse because, again, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 2 and we'll see it's about Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit puts them together, these two verses. Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll see that verse repeated. Now Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 tells you who we're talking about. It's going to give you a vision, but we see Jesus. The vision that uh, Paul the Apostle wanted to give the Hebrew people is you need to see Jesus. Now speaking about Jesus, what about Jesus? Um, Verse 12, saying, we see Jesus saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Jesus saying to the Father, Father, I will take your name and declare it unto my brethren. That was the prophetic office. The prophet would take the words of God, the name of God, and declare it to the people. Okay, so the prophet represented God to the people. But then the priest represents the people to God. So 12, you see Jesus in the prophetic office, verse 13, now he goes to the priestly office, and again, I will put my trust in him, in God, and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me, now he's got the children that God given to him, and he's going to represent them as an inter intercessory prayer to the Father. So the priest takes the burdens of the people and brings them before God. The prophet takes God's word, gives it to the people, the priest takes the people's concerns and burdens and gives them to God. So Jesus is transitioning here after he's prayed for himself to strengthen himself in the first five verses. He's now going to take the high priest office and take these disciples and bring them before the Father. I'm going to learn a lot in this 17th chapter. Let's go to uh, John 17 and take a look and see what he does as he brings the disciples before God in prayer. Verse 6, again, communion prayer with the Father. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, 
and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So now he's, as he's warming up in the prayer, he's recalling to the Lord, he's saying, I did the work you told me to do as prophet. I manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. He manifested the name of God. God's name, Exodus chapter 3, I am that I am. What did he do as the prophet? In, in uh, John's gospel, seven times he tells you, I am the bread of life. Okay? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. He has manifested the attributes in the name of God to these men. Seven times explaining what the I am is. He manifested the name. And he says, I manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Now, manifesting the name is something that Jesus had promised the Lord he would do. As a matter of fact, it was a prophetic fulfillment of Psalm 22. And again, we saw this, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Psalm 22 is the great prayer on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But that psalm makes a, a, a great transition toward the end. And uh, in Psalm 22, verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ came not to glorify himself, but to glorify the Father and glorify the Father's name and glorify the Father's word and declare the Father's word. Now, we're going to see very interestingly in this prayer, he did this as to set an example for us to set an example for us so that he could rightly say to us, follow me, follow thou me. I will set an example for you. What a great leader we have. He's not a leader that just said, let me give you some examples of what you ought to do and I'll, I'll show you in the classroom. He actually went out into the laboratory of the world and he led and blazed an example and said, now I've blazed this trail for you. Follow the very trail I've walked in. So the, the understanding would be this. We are to declare the name that, that God has given to us. And the name God's given to us, we'll see, is the name of Jesus Christ. That's the name we're to declare. Now, verse 6, I have manifested, back to John's gospel, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were. Thine they were. Now, this might get you questioning. Thine they, they, they were the fathers. And thou gavest them me. Now, this verse will be misinterpreted by a group of people out there known as Calvinists. Here they come again. Here comes the Calvin train. Jump on real quick. It moves quickly. Uh, they're, they're on their rocking horse, their hobby horse again, because they're going to take every verse like this and rest it to the thought that certain people are under the sovereign grace and the unconditional election of God, and they've been chosen from eternity past to be part of the elect and be saved. And so there, this is a proof text right here. These men, these disciples were gods from time immemorial, from time eternity, and the Calvinist gets on his hobby horse and rides this verse out. And, and it's, it's comical to me. And we're going to explain that this is not what he was talking about here. He's not talking about sovereign grace, which does not occur in the Bible. He's not talking about unconditional election, which is another phrase that does not occur in the Bible. These are man-made artifacts. These are interpretations put on by a man named John Calvin. What, what he's talking about here, but, but you know what? They're so funny because I always get on their rocking horse. When I was a little kid, we, I used to have one of those little hobby horses with the springs, and I'd get on it when I was three years old. And, and I'll tell you what, if you're a Calvinist out there, this is what you ought to do if you pastor a Calvinist church. Get rid of the pews and put hobby horses in there. And so then, then a Christian will know when he walks in, he looks, oh, there's no pews, there's horses. Oh, this is a Calvinist church. Then he would know. I mean, then he's, he knows what he's getting into ahead of time. You think about that for a while. <laughs> Anyways, they, they, thine they were, and thou gavest them me. Now, now, what he's talking about, thine they were, it doesn't mean that they were elect from time immemorial. What he's saying is these were Jewish men. These were Jewish men. How do I know that? Thine they were, they have kept thy word. All they had up until the time Jesus Christ came were the Old Testament scriptures. 
That's what they were expected to read. That's what they expected to believe were the Old Testament scriptures. Turn to Exodus chapter 19. This is what he's referring to, Exodus 19. These men that were called to walk with Jesus, these men that were called to be apostles unto Jesus and to do signs and wonders, like it said in the one uh, uh, Isaiah 8 when we were in that verse, you turn to Exodus 19, I'll just read Isaiah 8 again. While you're getting to Exodus 19, Isaiah 8 said, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and wonders in Israel. These were Jewish men of the children of Israel. The apostles were given signs and wonders, and these Jewish men were given to Jesus. Now, here's what they were. Thine they were. Isaiah, uh, Exodus chapter uh, 19, uh, verse 5. Now, this is the Lord speaking. Um, let's just see. And he's speaking to Moses, and now it says, and, and the Lord was telling them, here, verse 3, just so you know who's speaking. And the, the, the Moses went up into, unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, now just follow, Thou shalt say to the house of Jacob and to the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you up unto myself. Verse 5, Now therefore... If the children of Israel, the, the house of Jacob, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Now what he's saying here, the covenant that's being made right here, that God is beginning to make is the Sinai covenant, the, the, the covenant of Moses with the Jewish people. And it's a conditional covenant. There's an if and a then. Okay? If ye will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Applying to Jews. Now, now what Jesus is saying in his prayer right here, he's saying, these Jewish men, they've kept your word. They have done what you commanded them to do in Exodus. They have fulfilled the law in their heart. They may not have fulfilled it in their person. They've probably fallen a number of times. But in their heart, they have fulfilled the law so much so that when I came as Messiah, they recognized me. And I came unto my own, and most of my own received me not. But these men right here, verse 6, John 17, 6, when I manifested thy name unto these men, they kept thy word. End of the verse. So thine they were. They were yours. And what's happening now, Jesus is saying, is there's a dispensational shift. There's a movement from an old covenant, the Sinai covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and there's going to be a move into the new covenant, the covenant of Jesus Christ's blood. And that's why he says in the sixth verse, uh, I manifested my name unto the men. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. You have taken your peculiar treasure according to the Sinai covenant, according to the law of Moses, and now you've given them to me, and they'll no longer be Jews like that. They will be Christians under the new covenant, the everlasting covenant of my blood. That's what's going on here. It has nothing to do with the, the Calvinist uh, rocking horse interpretation of sovereign grace and unconditional election. It's saying these men have kept thy word. They did what you told them to do in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. And because of that, they were yours. And they were Jews. And now you're moving where there'll be neither Jew nor Greek unto the church. And they're going to be mine. They're going to be translated into the kingdom of your dear son, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. A translation is going to occur in these men. These men lived at the time of a major dispensational shift. You and I live in our dispensation of grace. People before that lived in their dispensation of the Mosaic Law. These men lived at the transition time. Amazing time to live. So Ours is an amazing time to live, but we are within this uh, dispensation and we will not cross into the new dispensation. We will be raptured out of here. There will be some Jews alive who will also go through a major transitional shift as it transitions from grace into the millennial kingdom. We are at the cusp of that age change right now. 
but we will not be making that transition like these men did. This was an amazing transition for these Jewish men. As the church, we cannot do that. We are bound, we are boundaried right inside our dispensation. These Jewish men were allowed to pass through that doorway. That's what's going on here. Does that make sense? Do you see? Thine they were, they have kept thy word, Exodus 19, verse 5. Therefore they were Jews, your peculiar treasure, and now you're giving them to me as they're being translated into the kingdom of the Son. They're going to be Christians. That's what's going on. It's got nothing to do with Calvin. I'd like to, if I could draw, I'd like to make a comic strip called Calvin and Hodge because there's a theology <laughs> book written by Hodge that's Calvinistic and do a lot of comics about it. But anyways, uh, well, let's get on to the text. It's much better than, than the rocking horse stuff. Um, verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. In other words, they're very sensitive in their heart to your word. So much so that when I came and told them about the new thing that you will be doing and you will be building a church, they received it. And they realized that, that what, what I gave them actually came from you. Verse, end of verse 7. Where the other men said, oh no, this isn't possible because God spoke through Moses. He can't possibly be speaking today through this prophet Jesus. So this, these words of Jesus couldn't possibly be of God. He's of Beelzebub. But these men have the sens sensitivity to recognize, yes, God gave that and God is giving this and they all fit together perfectly well. And these words that Jesus are speaking that he speaks to us, they're of God, the same God that spoke to Moses. They had the sensitivity in their heart. A lot of people don't have that sensitivity today. A lot of people are still locked in the Mosaic system. A number of Jews are locked in the Mosaic system. A number of Gentiles called Catholics are locked in a Mosaic type system of, of works and sacraments and, and law, and they can't seem to get the grace of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he's finished the work for them, and they need not work anymore for their salvation. But these men had the sensitivity to know that anything I've said, anything I was given, it came from you. The works I did, I did by you, Father. Verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. Now, the work that he said that he would do, verse 4 and 8, Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I finished the work as a prophet. As a prophet, I gave them words. I finished the work which thou gavest me to do, verse 8, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. The Lord would say to his prophets, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, speak the word that I've given to thee. Tell them, thus saith the Lord. And so Jesus Christ came forth declaring, uh, Repent! The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he began his teaching with the Sermon on the Mount. And he began his teaching in the synagogues. And he went all about Jerusalem and Judea and Israel, teaching in the synagogues and preaching in the streets. And what did most people say? They turned from that which he said and would not receive the words. What did he do? He continued to give them the words that God gave, whether they would hear or forbear. The majority of people forbear. Verse 8, But I've given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they... The disciples in this upper room have received them. Have received them. Now, I wish this would happen today in Christianity. <laughs> because Jesus Christ has given unto us the words that the Father gave him. If you are holding a holy Bible in your hands, a holy Bible that's supposed to be where the word of a king is, there is power that I counsel thee to keep the commandment of the king in regard to the oath of God. If you have a King James Holy Bible, you have the words that Jesus Christ gave from God. And very few Christians will receive it. It takes a tender heart to receive that. Because the same folks out there that were beguiling Israel into not believing the words that Jesus spoke when he was there in person, manifest in the flesh, the same type of false teachers are out there today that will try to get you to resist the very words Jesus has given in a King James Bible, fighting the Holy Spirit that's trying to tell you every word of God is pure. The law of the Lord is perfect. These are the words that God 
has given. Um, we'll see later, I'll show you in verse 11. But, but Christians have lost that tenderness in their heart because they've been beguiled, as Paul said, I fear, as the serpent beguiled Eve, that your minds would be beguiled from the simplicity that's in Christ. Jesus Christ will not give you 450 Bibles. He's not going to do that. He's going to pray in this very chapter that we would all be one. And it's hard to be one with 450 different Bibles. I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Jesus promised they would have the words. He said we would be judged in the last day by those very words. Now, if we don't have them, how can we be judged? But he's the righteous judge. And therefore, the words have been given to us. I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. One of the things you get when you receive the word of God is you get a confident assurance of your knowledge of not only salvation, but your relationship with God. I see Christians groping today. I just got a copy of Christianity Today that came yesterday in the mail. And you would not believe this clown that's running around that has a major ministry worldwide nowadays that's talking about uh, hearing from God. And the way you hear from God is you hear from Him in nature, and you hear from Him from what other people say, and you hear from Him in movies, and you hear from Him. He mentioned the scriptures along the way somewhere buried in about 12 things. I told my wife about them. And we were reading it and just shaking our head. It's through the scriptures. Amen. The sure script that's been written by God, when we receive that, we know surely that Jesus was sent from the Father and our, and our relationship is assured. That assurance that we have, I, I remember the change that came in my life when I was able to receive the King James Bible as God's only word. The strength of assurance that I had in my relationship with God was, was intensified. But I had to receive it. And then came the assurance. They have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst sent me. And I have believed that not only God sent Jesus, but he's given us his word. It's very strengthening, very powerful. Because the work Jesus came to do also was to give the very words of life. These are the words of life you hold in your hand. I'm so thankful. So verse 9 he says, I pray for them. I pray for who? The disciples. The men right here in the upper room that have received this teaching. These men who have had a tender heart and they attempted to, in their life, follow whatever they heard from God. In other words, as, as light was given to them, they followed it. And because of that, more light was given to them and they followed that. And so they had the Old Testament scriptures and they looked for the Messiah and then I came and they followed me and then I taught and they continued to follow me and then I taught hard things, John chapter 6, and many turned and said, this is a hard teaching. I think I'll leave. And they said, to whom shall we turn? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And they stayed with me as more light was given. They continued to increase in their walk with me. And many Christians will come to Jesus as a Savior, and then when they hear the truth about one Bible, well, that's a hard teaching. I can't handle that. And they walk away. But he says, these have continued with me, and they have believed that thou didst sent me, and I pray for them. I pray for these disciples. And then he says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for thine they are. Now, we learn a great truth here. Jesus Christ does not pray for the world. Today there are people all over the world getting together in prayer meetings, praying for the world. Praying for all kinds of worldly things. The biggest prayer is, I pray there be peace. Peace in the world. Let's pray for peace in the world. And everybody holds their hands and prays for peace in the world. And there will be no peace in the world without the Prince of Peace. Yeah. Every single epistle that Paul wrote, he starts, Grace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and peace. Until you receive God's grace, there is no peace. And you don't receive God's grace until you receive His Son as your Savior, as your Lord and Savior. And then comes peace. It's always in that order. First grace and then peace. Let me show you an example of it. Turn to the book of Hebrews. This isn't in my notes. I'm ad libbing it here, but you'll enjoy this. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. Verses 1 and 2. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, watch carefully. Here was a priest 
that God had ordained in the Old Testament. And this priest met Abraham. And Abraham, being chosen by God to, to be a father of many nations, met this priest and learned more about the Most High God. And the name Melchizedek. Zedek means righteousness, righteousness, and Melchi means king. And look at it, the second verse, the way it works. Um, being by interpretation, first, being by interpretation, Melchizedek, king of righteousness. Melchizedek, king of And after that, also king of Salem. Salem was the city he was from. He was the king of Salem. Salem means peace. Shalom. Peace. Notice that. First righteousness, then peace. First Jesus Christ, our righteousness. First the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ getting righteousness, then peace. No grace, no righteousness, no peace. Prayers for world peace, forget them. God doesn't answer them. Jesus doesn't make those prayers. He does not pray for the world. The majority of praying in the world never gets to God's ears because only Jesus is the only mediator and intercessor that can bring a prayer before God the Father. God never hears the prayers of the world and Jesus doesn't pray for the world. I work, uh, I, I was born, I was raised a Catholic, I wasn't born a Catholic, I, someone sprinkled water on me as a little baby, I had no choice in the matter, but I was raised a Catholic, and I've heard Catholic prayers, I hear them to this day, working at Catholic institutions, and they pray prayers that Jesus does not bring before the Father, because he prays not for the world, and the people of the world and their vain prayers are not heard, the prayer of the wicked is abomination to the Lord, it says in the book of Proverbs. God does not hear his prayers. And Jesus is the only mediator that can bring a prayer before God. He's the only intercessor, and he prays not for the world. He told us in uh, chapter 15, verse 19, speaking to the disciples face to face in the upper room, if ye disciples were of the world, the world would love you. But because ye are not of the world. There's a, there's a distinction. There's a separation. There is a wall that God puts down between his church and the world. And Jesus, as the high priest, is to bring the prayers of God's people to the Father. And God's people are the children that have been given Jesus by God, the children of God, by faith in Christ Jesus, born of the Spirit, born again. Those are the only prayers that reach God. No other prayers reach God. Isn't it good to be saved? When you pray, God hears. God listens. When the lost pray, their prayers are ricocheting off the ceiling and the walls and the floor. They're going no further than the room they're in. Now, maybe the devil intercepts them, but God doesn't hear them. Because Jesus is the only intercessor, and I pray for my disciples, for the children that you've given me. I pray not for the world. He is the mediator. He is the high priest that we read about in Hebrews. Let's just get some verses to confirm it, because then I want to show you something. This is not an example for us to follow. And I'll show you. We are not high priests. Jesus is the high priest. I will show you the prayers we're supposed to pray according to his teaching. This is Jesus in his mediator work as high priest. Hebrews chapter 7. This prayer is recorded for us and we're thankful for it, but this is not something we follow. We are not the high priest. Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 24. But this man... And he's talking about Jesus, verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Verse 24. This man, Jesus, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. He never dies. Therefore, verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. The only way you come unto God is by Jesus. Seeing he ever liveth, to make intercession for them. 
In other words, we do not have a, a high priest that dies every 70 or 80 years and we need to find a new one. We have a high priest that lives forever up there, seated at the right hand of God to take the prayers of the dearest saint like Paul the Apostle all the way up to the dearest saint like Joe the pastor, all the way up to God the Father over 2,000 years. He ever liveth to make intercession. He makes intercession for those that are his. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I pray not for the world. Romans chapter 8. Verse 34. It's the second half of the verse I'm interested in. It starts out, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. For us. Now, now who is the us that he's talking about? The us that he's talking about in the entire chapter is them that are in Christ Jesus, to whom there is no condemnation. Verse 1. Them who have received Jesus as their Savior. Them who are led by the Spirit of God. Those that are the sons of God. Those that have received the Spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Those who have the new birth. That's who he prays for. Uh, verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts, Jesus who searches the hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. If you have taken Christ as your Savior, you are one of the saints. Amen. By the way, you'll never find in the text of Scripture the word saint in a singular form. It's always plural. It's always saints. You are one of the saints. God wants us to remember one of His children. Okay? We're one of the saints. I'm one of the saints. You take Christ, you're one of the saints. I'm not Saint Michael. I'm one of the saints. There's no singular mention of a saint in the text of Scripture. We're one of the saints. And Jesus Christ makes intercession for the saints, according to the will of God. Back to uh, John's Gospel. Now, that says the mediator role of high priest. He prays not for the world. He makes intercession for the saints. When you, as one of the saints, have a need, when you, as one of the saints, have a burden, when you as one of the saints go through a trial or a tribulation or a temptation and you go on your knees in the name of Christ Jesus praying, Jesus takes that prayer and brings it before God the Father and answers your prayer because you're one of His children and He loves you and He laid down His life for you. And if He's willing to do that, anything you have to ask is a lot less. I mean, that's pocket change compared to what he did. And therefore, he answers that prayer, if you're one of his saints. And that's his job. But what about us as the saints? So are we to shut out our prayers for the world? Well, let me show you the example that he left for us as he was still in the role of prophet. And we are prophets to the world. We are the ones that the only ones that can bring the world the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are entrusted as stewards of the mysteries of God, bringing the gospel forward. So let's see what he did as a prophet for the world. Turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Still in the prophetic role here, not in a priestly role. As one of the prophets, he's being persecuted and going to die as a prophet, as so many prophets were slain. Uh, verse, uh, pick it up in 32. And there were also uh, two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with him, with them. They derided him, saying, Oh, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And so now here he is, as a prophet, he's dying at the hands of the Jews and the Gentiles, the, the elders and the priests and the people and the rulers of Israel and the soldiers of Rome. And he's being put to death by these people. The world is putting him to death. The Lord of glory is being killed. 
They're putting to death the Prince of Life. And yet, the very people that are killing him, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As the perfect man, as the prophet, he prays for forgiveness, to leave an example to us, the same example that he preached, for example, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Sometimes we get tempted when the world treats us poorly to be like Jesus in John 17. I pray not for the world. I'm not praying for that guy. That's a natural spirit inside of us. I'm not going to pray for him. You know what he did to me? That's exactly when you need to pray for the guy, when he does something for it to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You've heard that it hath been said, Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. People say that all the time. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. When anybody does something to you as one of God's children, as one of the saints, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you face persecution, trial, temptation, they know not what they do. They're still in darkness. They haven't seen the light yet. Um, if you're real honest with yourself, at least I'm honest with myself, I persecuted Christians before my salvation. I'm not saying I whipped them or did anything physically, psychologically, verbally, in those manners. Belittled them, ridiculed, mocked. I'm guilty. I did that. I was in darkness. I did it, like Paul says, in ignorance. They're doing it in ignorance too. So the example left for us is not John 17. That's the example of him interceding up there in glory for the children. He's not praying for the world. But what about for those of us who are in the world? When he was in the world, he prayed for the world. You're still in the world. You're to pray for those people. You and I are the only chance that they have to bring them to light. No one else knows how to properly pray for them. The priests telling them, uh, what do they say, go in peace, uh, pray for world peace, do good to your neighbor, don't even know how to properly pray for these people. What's the prayers they need? Father, forgive them. Father, extend mercy to them. Father, draw them to Jesus. No man can come except you draw, Father. Father, bring them to the gospel. Father, help them get the new birth. That's how you pray. Let me show you how Paul did that. Go to Romans chapter 10. Paul leaves us an example as someone who's left down here. Okay? Paul, Romans chapter 10. Paul was a man that was, uh, his father was Jewish, his mother was Jewish. Uh, he grew up in a, in a city in Greece that was actually controlled by the Romans, so he had a, a varied, he was like a mutt in terms of his background. But he loved the Jewish people. And although he was the apostle to the Gentiles and the Jews persecuted him greatly for what they said, you abandoned their religion. You've left our religion. You were a good Jew like the rest of us and now you're a Christian. As far as we're concerned, you're dead. You're as good as dead. We're not going to spend... You, you're not allowed in the synagogue anymore. You've been excommunicated. And they, and they persecuted Paul verbally and physically. You can read about his persecutions in Acts. But notice where he was in Romans 10 verse 1. Brethren... My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He continued to pray for those Jewish people that were lost. What was the prayer? That they might be saved. That they might be saved. Jesus doesn't pray for the world because he's right now he's out of the world. And he's in heaven. And he's praying for those that have been born of the Spirit. But while we're in the world, we're to follow his example. While he was in the world, he prayed for those to receive mercy. And that's what they need. They need mercy. Blessed are the merciful. And we need to be full of mercy for those people. Uh, turn to us, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says, I pray for Israel that they might be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul teaching a young man, Timothy, says, Young Timothy, my son in the faith, you're now going to be a pastor of a church. Let me tell you one of the things you want to do with that church. 
uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, <coughs> verse 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men. For the king. For kings. You mean like Titus and Caesar and Nero? Yeah, and for all that are in authority. You mean like Bill Clinton and John Kerry and Hillary Clinton? Oh, that's rough, isn't it? I want to pray for conservative leaders. Amen. Now, you will pray for liberal leaders, too. How often have you prayed for the salvation of Bill and Hillary Clinton and John Kerry? I have. I have. Janet Reno. Pray for her salvation. See, that's the example left for us, and that's the command given to us, is to pray for the salvation of all people. When you do this, the Holy Spirit will work in your heart. It will, it will soften your heart toward people. Let me tell you, before I got saved, I was politically active. Very active from a conservative standpoint, especially fiscal conservatism and economics. And I couldn't understand the mind of a liberal. I still can't understand the mind of a liberal. They confuse me. And when I see them, like the Democratic Convention is together now, you know, you want to prayer these uh, imprecatory prayers like a tornado would hit the center. That's your natural man. Okay? What you need is to get down and to pray for these people. Father, be merciful to them. And you need to bring some names up in particular. And you need to be honest in your prayer. And tell God, I don't like this person. And then say, but God, do you like this person at all? Or do you, do you care for this person? Do you want this person to get saved? Amen. You so loved the world that you gave your son, and they're part of the world, and you'd like to give your son to them. Soften my heart so that if I'm in a room with them, I will not allow politics to get between the gospel and me and them. I'm going to let the politics off to the side. I'm now able to sit in the room with liberals who are off the wall, talking about environmentalism and socialism and go, that's interesting, that's curious, and let it just, and not even get stirred up about it in my spirit anymore as I wait for the opportunity to give them the gospel. And that's through prayer. That's through prayer. Intercession, supplication for all men, for kings and those in authority who are mostly socialist and liberal. And by the way, you need to pray for your newspaper reporters. I mean, really, honestly, you need to stop yourself and, and ask God at that moment to be instant in prayer so that you won't let that stumble someone to getting to Jesus Christ. Because the only way they think in darkness is the way they think. And if they sense that you're a member of a political extreme opposite to them, they'll have nothing to do with you. But if you will not let that come in between and you just listen to, listen, listen to the things they're saying, nod your head, I never considered that. That's interesting. So that's the way you think about that. And that allows a relationship to come where then you can bring Jesus to them and bring them mercy. That's what they need. Jesus doesn't pray for the world, but he left an example himself personally when he was in the world as a prophet and through Paul and Timothy and others and commands to teach us to pray for the world, for all men, intercession, giving of thanks. We have just a few minutes to go. Verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. As a high priest, he prays not for the world. We're the only hope they have. They cannot pray for themselves. They don't know what to pray for themselves. They pray goofy prayers, not in the name of Jesus Christ. We're the only ones that can pray for them. And when we pray, Jesus listens. And then Jesus brings it before the Father. When we, Jesus said, no man can come except the Father draw him. One of my greatest prayers that I pray, one of my most frequent prayers, is Father, draw that individual. Father, draw. If the Father begins the movement, see the, the Spirit and the wind bloweth where it listeth. And the Father has to get the wind of the Spirit moving in their life. I can't do that. If I tied them up and opened their eyes and made them look at gospel tapes 24 hours a day and just read Bible to them, they can't get saved. The birth is of the water, that's the word, and the Spirit. And if the Spirit's not blowing, all the water, all the seed, all the Bible in the world won't save them. So the prayer is, Father, draw. 
And then when you draw, I'm ready to sow in water. And we have to pray for the world. All right, we come to the end, Joe says. Any questions on what we're looking at today? Yes, brother. Yeah, uh, earlier you mentioned uh, the article in Christianity Today. Yes. About that individual that said, you know, God speaks through nature and things like that. Um, if you can kind of just slightly expound on that, because I remember, like, before I was saved, um, I'd go outside and, you know, and i see the stars and things like that, and it was like God was speaking to my heart saying, you know, I exist. Amen. Then, Amen. Things like that, and through other people, what they would say to me, it'd be like, almost like they knew what I was going through. It was almost like the Lord speaking to me. And that capacity. I, mean, I, I understand that. And the Lord does speak in the, in the Bible, it speaks in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God, so he speaks through creation. And then it talks in Romans chapter 2, and he speaks through the conscience. But, but those who are, are like small lights, and hopefully you will follow that light, and then ultimately he will speak through, after creation and conscience, he'll speak through Christ. And that's what this is all about, mm -hmm. to bring you to Christ. And then once he's spoken to you through Christ, then you have the words that he's given. And therefore you have a Psalm like 119, which says, Thy precepts are above anything my teacher has taught me. They're above silver and gold. That's creation. They're above all these other things. They're above my conscience in my heart because my heart can be deceitful. My conscience doesn't perfectly work. But now I have the precepts that you've given me and the words that you've given me. And I've received them. And now I know surely. Because just through creation and conscience, I don't surely know about salvation. I can't have that assurance. It's only through the Word of God. So those are small lights to lead you to the greatest of all, which is the light of the Scripture. Thy Word is a lamp and a light. And the light of Christ is found inside that. So, so the gentleman was elevating these other things? He's elevating these other things. It, it, I, I have to bring the article in. It's, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> it was really something to see. <laughs> the poor guy. He had some of the craziest things. As a matter of fact, he had, he had one... Uh, a philosophy was that you know there's a natural spark of God inside us that needs to be brought up and, and, and in order for uh, God must decrease so that we can increase to be all that we can be and that's just the opposite of what John the Baptist said where I must decrease and he must increase so it, it was a wild thing at one point in the article he said you know what you need to do one of the best things you can do is get out of church he said I got out of church for a year stop reading your Bible he says you'll hear more from God now this was this some of the uh, the, the words of philosophy that this man had. And it's philosophy and vain deceit that will beguile you from Christ and from his person. Jesus is the word of God. So, anyway, yes, it's Christianity today. <laughs> Father, thank you that you're faithful, even though we're not. You are faithful and true. And thank you for Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that he prays for us, the saints who are his children. And Lord, then he commands us to pray for the world that they may become saints through the grace and the righteousness 